Good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks, Ty. Great to see you up here. It's, uh, it means a lot to me, actually, to start this day by being introduced by, by Ty Pyle, because Ty is a very good friend of mine, someone with whom I went through basic training when we were like 18 or 19, and uh, someone with whom I sailed in my first operational ship. In fact, I stood as Ty's second officer to watch in Terra Nova back in 1981. And immediately recognize an officer with uh, extraordinary leadership, skills, talent, uh, a team builder who obviously has excelled in his career, and uh, um, someone I'm very pleased to continue to call um, a great friend. So thank you, Tony. Um, fellow flag officers, especially uh, my very good friend, uh, Alistair Mark Stanwell, First Sea Lord. Thank you so much, Mark, for being here today. Um, Retired flag officers, uh, Admiral John Anderson, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Gary Arnett, uh, Rear Admiral Ian Mack. Um, so many uh, representatives from, from, from around the world, industry, academics. Um, good morning, welcome to Victoria. Uh, welcome to this conference. Great to be here, Victoria, the home of, uh, of our West Coast fleet. I woke up this morning, I'm staying at uh, Bill True Love's uh, cottage. Um, just up beside his house, and I looked out over <coughs> Scroggs Rocks, Visgard, up to Race Rocks, across the Straits of Juan de Fuca to the Cascade Mountains. And I gotta tell you, that's a view that I don't see too often in Ottawa. And uh, although we do have the majestic Rideau Canal and uh, the Ottawa River there, it's wonderful to be here, to be with our sailors. Uh, like many of you who sailed in Vancouver yesterday, to, to get reacquainted with the energy, with the talent, the enthusiasm, uh, uh, the capability of, of our Navy here, um, and for those of us who serve at the strategic level in Ottawa, to take that energy um, back with us um, and drive towards delivering that future fleet uh, of tomorrow so vital to Canada. And like you that sailed in Vancouver yesterday, you saw our sailors and, and what they can do. Just recently I uh, went to Newfoundland, to St. John's, and uh, greeted HMCS Charlottetown returning from a eight-month deployment to the Eastern Med uh, through the Suez Canal and into the Arabian Sea, uh, where she uh, was forward deployed for a uh, high readiness frigate, ready to do whatever was required across the spectrum of operations, and if necessary, to go in harm's way in the vital national interest. And that ship, uh, I sailed with her from St. John's to Halifax, and what a great opportunity to sail with to stand with, to speak to, uh, very proud, uh, capable, a ship's company who knew that they had done something very special. And for so someone like me, um, to, to spend that time with our sailors and they can come back, and then to see their families on the jetty, that excitement, that enthusiasm, um, and then to come back to Ottawa, my wife uh, looked at me and said, what, what, what happened? You look about 10 years younger, and I haven't seen you like this since well, the last time you went to see it. Um, and so that's what really, i got, got to tell you, that's what that keeps us uh, mo moving on as we deal with uh, what I like to tell my officers in Ottawa is the, the great business of um, mastering uh, the art of strategic ambiguity um, uh, in Ottawa. And I think many of you serve in uh, capitals, uh, headquarters around the world, know exactly to which I speak. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Some of you I met just last week in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, great to see you coming all the way across the Pacific. Um, it says a great deal of the excellent reputation that this conference has built up over the last several years uh, as a venue for a frank and meaningful dialogue on those uh, maritime strategic issues that you touched on already that really matter, not only to us, but to the many countries represented here, um, and indeed, to the world. Um, per permit me then to begin by, by thanking uh, our hosts, uh, Dr. Alan Gavlin, Royal Rose University, uh, the Asia Pacific Center uh, for Security Studies, and of course, uh, Rear Admiral Bill Trulove and, uh, and his team uh, here in Maritime Forces Pacific for, for setting this up. And I especially would like to recognize uh, Dr. Jim Petillier, uh, who all of you know is widely uh, recognized as one of Canada's preeminent experts on all things uh, related to Asian Pacific affairs. Um, I would imagine that many of you are actually here 
uh, due to the personal relationships uh, and, and friendships that you've developed with Jim uh, over the years. And, um, I've known Jim for, for many, many years, and I can still remember uh, as the captain of Calgary uh, with Jim embarked uh, going into Manila in 1999, uh, and Jim had set up a, a workshop uh, uh, to, to be run in, 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 uh, in my wardroom. And in comes the president of, uh, of the University of Manila in the Philippines, in comes the uh, defense minister, former defense minister, in comes um, pretty well um, uh, the sort of intellectual elite uh, of the Philippines, um, all engaged in maritime strategic issues, and all there because of Jim's networks, his friendships, his work. And uh, I would just like to start here by asking all of you to join me in recognizing this uh, very special man. I'd also like to acknowledge the generosity of the corporate sponsors uh, who have made this conference possible. You know, um, uh, these are interesting times in terms of uh, fiscal probity um, and uh, pressures on various budgets. And I'd like to think that uh, those of you in defense industries that choose to uh, sponsor events like this um, view this as a sort of a corporate social responsibility line uh, in, your, in your business plans. You are enabling uh, the great business of the country to, to go forward. You are enabling these sort of networking events to take place. And I thank you most sincerely. Um, and I, my thanks go out as well to all of the organizers of this event who have assembled you an impressive array of experts uh, on aircraft uh, bro carrier programs, uh, illegal trafficking at sea, unmanned vehicles, uh, maritime security, and what's most important to us, uh, shipbuilding, uh, to help us work through the challenges and more importantly, the opportunities that these issues present for us. Uh, my aim this morning is not to address the themes that you will be exploring in detail this week, but instead I wish to lay out for you a, a rationale for strategic cooperation and trust in this 21st maritime century. A theme that dominated discussions last week with fellow chiefs of Navy at the Western Pacific Naval Symposium in Malaysia, and earlier this year at the Inter-American Naval Conference in Mexico, last year at the International Sea Power Symposium um, in Newport, um, and at all conferences such as this. Uh, but before I do so, though, I would like to first give you a, a strategic snapshot of the Royal Canadian Navy. <coughs> We find ourselves today in a moment of unprecedented opportunity and renewal. And this opportunity is due to the convergence of several factors. The first of which is the government's determination to make significant investments in the Canadian forces as laid out in the 2008 Defence Roadmap called the Canada First Defence Strategy. Now, much of this initial investment was understandably focused on enabling our troops for combat success in Afghanistan. C-17s for strategic lift, Chinook helicopters for tactical lift, and armored fighting vehicles, weapons, and counter IED systems to both protect our soldiers and to give them the tools necessary to defeat the enemy. But the Canada First Defense Strategy was about much more than the air land battle. It included the decision to modernize the backbone of the Navy's surface fleet our 12 Halifax-class frigates, of which Vancouver, of course, is one that you sailed in yesterday, and to provide them with a range of new sensors and systems that will give these ships and their crews what they need to sail confidently into the increasingly com congested, complex, and time-compressed joint and combined littoral operating areas, both at home in our three ocean estates and overseas alongside our allies. Like HMCS Regina, deployed today in the Arabian Sea, and like HMC ships Charlottetown and Vancouver, which sailed alongside our NATO partners in the Air Sea Campaign that resulted in the liberation of Libya's people from the tyranny of Gaddafi. Three other Canada First projects, the Joint Support Ship to replace our AORs, the Arctic and offshore patrol ship to give us a new and persistent patrol presence in the high Arctic, and the Canadian surface combatant to replace our destroyers and eventually the frigates, are progressing steadily. 
And these programs, which are clearly my focus in Ottawa these days, along with the Air Force's modernized Aurora Maritime Patrol aircraft and the new Cyclone Maritime Helicopter, along with the full operationalization of our Victoria-class submarines, together make up the most comprehensive period of peacetime fleet renewal since the Royal Canadian Navy came into being in 1910. And propelling us forward is a new and for Canada unprecedented national shipbuilding and procurement strategy. And through the strategic partnering with industry, the Canadian government has established long-term relationships with two shipyards, one east in Halifax, and the other not too far away, obviously, in Vancouver, that will build these ships, the JSS, the ALPS, and the CSC, and all with the stated intent of creating and sustaining a continuous build program for ships in Canada, something that maritime stakeholders have been working towards for decades in this country, and it is something that I view as an extremely positive policy development for the Navy. And why? Because we are going to need these ships. Perhaps never before have the world's oceans been as important to national security and prosperity as they are today as ocean politics, both at home and abroad, have continued to intensify in this, and I'll say it again, increasingly maritime 21st century. Throughout the world's ocean, seas and oceans, from the Caribbean to the Mediterranean, and from the Eastern Pacific to the Indian Ocean, the Canadian Navy is playing a prominent role in supporting Canada's desire for a larger presence, not only in our three ocean approaches, uh, but for greater levels of regional engagement, for the promotion of collective solutions to security <coughs> and defense, and for operations alongside our allies in defense of the international system. At home, the Arctic, in particular, is a high policy priority for Canadians. Visitors to Canada, many of you here, very quickly come to realize that the Arctic plays a major role in our national psyche. The true north, strong and free from our national anthem, resonates as much for Canadians as do the words, the rocket's red glare, for Americans. Canada's Arctic archipelago is a very long way from where the vast majority of Canadians live <coughs> in our cities like Vancouver, Calgary, and Toronto here in the south. The Northwest Passage, for example, is further from the homes of our east and west coast fleets in Halifax and here in Esquimalt than our London and Tokyo, respectively. Canada's high north is, a, is an ocean space, a vast island area set in ice, an oceanic ice field, if you will, that both defines and dominates the environment. But unlike any other ocean space in the world, it is virtually inaccessible except for a short but lengthening season in the midsummer and early fall. For much of the remainder of the year, which retains the high north in a nice grip, and nowhere else on Earth, with the exception of Antarctica, is the environment less forgiving to the unprepared. For mariners, the Arctic allows few mistakes, leaves little margin for error, and so therefore demands exceptional forethought and planning in order to deploy, to operate, sustain, and achieve mission success there. And for these reasons, it is truly a strategic decision for Canada to not just look north, but to go there as we hasten the delivery of joint sea, land, and air capabilities that will permit the Canadian forces to operate in the north persistently, effectively, and safely during that lengthening navigable season that is seeing increasing maritime and human activity rates. For the Royal Canadian Navy, these capabilities include the Arctic and offshore patrol ships I mentioned previously, as well as a deep water earthing and fueling facility in Anacific at the top end of Baffin Island near the eastern entrance to the Northwest Passage, as well as, in the fullness of time, unmanned aerial and underwater vehicles, all supported by a wide area networked surveillance system from seabed to space. As I think most of you in this room know all too well, the prospects of a commercially viable sea passage across the Arctic Basin 
connecting the rich economies of Northern Europe and Asia is still many years off, but it's still not as far as many predicted not so long ago. Recent and anticipated improvements in industrial extraction technologies will eventually make Arctic seabed resources commercially exploitable, with prospects of greatly increased destination shipping going in and out of the Arctic rather than through it. And the economic stakes are potentially enormous, awaiting each of the five Arctic coastal states in their offshore estates are a precious inheritance for decades to come. Vast energy and mineral reserves that have already been discovered or are believed to lie in the Arctic Basin and its periphery. And all of this will eventually bring new and unprecedented levels of human activity to the high north and with it increased risks of marine incident and environmental accident. And this is why the Canadian Forces is in the north today, along with other federal agencies, to improve upon the competencies we need to operate successfully there. Now, there is much, and, and in my view, misplaced attention drawn to disagreements in the North, the status of the Northwest Passage being one, and insufficient attention being paid to the extensive international cooperation that is actually taking place. For instance, uh, the agreement reached between Norway and Russia on boundary delineation uh, issues uh, just a couple of years ago, a very positive step forward. Canada's relations with our northern neighbors are very positive. From an institutional perspective, northern issues are systematically being addressed through the Arctic Council, as attested to by the Search and Rescue Treaty, recently concluded by the member states. Canada is also cooperating on the scientific work required to define the extent of our continental shelf of the US and Denmark, and we are contributing to similar multinational efforts with Russia and Norway. Direct military cooperation is also evident in the invitations Canada has extended to our northern neighbors to observe and participate in our annual northern maritime security exercises, such as Operation Nanook. However, there are other parts of the world where strategic competition for oceanic resources is being driven by some national interests towards confrontation rather than cooperation. And nowhere is this more apparent than in the South China Sea. <coughs> Much like the Arctic Basin, the South China Sea is a region that is believed to be rich in seabed energy resources. But unlike the Arctic, the South China Sea is today crucial to global commerce. From a legal perspective, the region is overlaid with multiple overlapping claims and long simmering maritime disputes that are driving today's headlines, such as the ongoing East China Sea dispute between China and Japan. And just one week ago, today, in Kuala Lumpur, I found myself at a formal dinner hosted by uh, Admiral Tan Sri Aziz, commander of the Royal Malaysian Navy, and he cunningly seated me between, on my right, the deputy commander of the People's Liberation Army Navy, and on my left, the commander of the uh, Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. And it was interesting as I was going to the dinner, having watched CNN and, and BBC, to have watched some really interesting um, asking encounters uh, off of uh, some islands not too far from Taiwan. And then for a moment there, I had a I had a uh, fleeting illusion that I would apply the internationally acclaimed uh, uh, techniques of Canadian peacekeeping and get this all sort of resolved by dessert. <laughs> but last gen it wasn't to be, but it's still. Um, just being in the room, um, to talking to these uh, uh, fellow global <coughs> leaders, fellow mariners, that in itself is a priceless uh, currency in terms of building the strategic trust and cooperation necessary to move forward. In any event, I would argue that these disputes are not only of huge concern to those states whose shores wash upon the South China Sea, but are of concern to all of the world's states. 
because these disagreements could eventually place at risk the delicate balance struck in the Law of the Sea Convention between a coastal state's right to regulate and be stewards of their ocean approaches and between the international community's rights of free movement and access through the ocean commerce upon which the global economy literally floats. And in this vein, China's claims in the South China Sea may represent an unusually expansive interpretation of the law of the sea, but they are not unique. They may simply be a signal to the international community that a new balance is emerging in the maritime order. And that alone would be a major development. However, such a development would also signal something, I think, even more profound. Because if the international consensus through which the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea was derived was to begin to unravel, then the period of relative stability in ocean politics that the Convention achieved would be at risk. And that would matter to Davies. It's happened at least twice before, during periods when, like today, major shifts in global power and economic influence were occurring. I was reminded last week, while admiring the old Dutch architectural influence in the Malaysian city of Malacca, of the first such instance which occurred in the 17th century when the Dutch and the English went to war on three occasions to determine how the world's oceans would be regulated. Ironically, although the English eventually emerged from that nearly century-long struggle as the dominant maritime power, it was the Dutch legal tradition of Mario de Baron, the idea that the seas cannot be made sovereign and hence are free for all to use, which ra rapidly picked up traction because it was a better match to England's growing mercantile interests than the Mare Clausen doctrine of sea control that England had previously defended, the idea that the seas can be, can be made sovereign to the limits of effective state control. The second such instance occurred in the latter half of the 20th century, when the retreat of European colonialism created a host of new coastal states whose maritime interests could easily have come into conflict with those of the traditional maritime powers. But they didn't, due to one remarkable fact. That being that the international community chose to reconcile the two sets of interests, Mare Clausum and Mare Liberum, through consultation and cooperation, and not through conflict, because no one then saw that as in their national interest to enable instability to flourish in the global maritime domain. The result was arguably the most successful international treaty ever conceived, the 1982 Convention or UNCLOS, which effectively permitted the world's coastal states to enclose a vast majority of the world's ocean resources, but without prejudice to the tr traditional freedoms of navigation that are of vital interest to maritime nations like ours. It remains to be seen whether or not the international consensus that lies behind UNCLOS will continue to hold in the face of what may become existential pressures upon many states, both large and small. But there are few questions of greater importance in these opening decades of the 21st, and I'll say it again, maritime century. And that is why the South China Sea matters to all of us, and not merely to the coastal states of Southeast Asia. It's also why the Arctic matters to all of you. Cooperation in the Arctic is not simply in Canada's vital national interest. Strategic cooperation reinforces the legal maritime order upon which our collective security and prosperity surely depends, and upon which our navies must constantly strive to be ready to act together to defend. Ladies and gentlemen, strategic cooperation begins in trust in rooms such as this. Through frank discussions of our challenges, but with a firm commitment to seeing past those issues that may divide us as the instruments of national policy our navies will always be, to work towards what I firmly believe is among the greatest public goods of this globalized era, 
the promotion of good order at sea through the regulation of our ocean commons upon which the system of the world depends. Navies are not only a means of military action employed in the pursuit of national interests as states interpret them. They are any nation's vanguard that seeks to build bridges of understanding and shared interest among states. They are also the principal guarantor of good order in that wide common upon which men pass and women pass in all directions, to quote Alfred Mahan. Every sailor here, as first and foremost a professional mariner, understands that our oceans remain crucial to sustaining life on this planet. Each one of us understands that the ocean's riches are crucial to the future of all coastal states, many of which are struggling to secure a better life for their citizens. Each one of us understands how a regulated ocean commons underpins the global economy, upon which our prosperity and indeed our very way of life depends. And what I am speaking of here is, is finding that fine point of balance, that sweet spot where national self-interest and common global interest meet. I'm speaking of strategic choices that are ours to make, that will require strategic trust to be established and sustained among pragmatic, determined men and women of action, such as are gathered here today. I believe it to be within our collective grasp to realize its great purpose. Indeed, there may be no higher purpose. And all we need to do is to resolve ourselves to achieve it. So in closing, ladies and gentlemen, permit me again to extend to you all my welcome to this fifth Maritime Security Challenges Conference. I wish to thank you all for choosing to be here. And I look forward to a very stimulating and a rewarding series of professional discussions. Thank you.